Well, welcome uh, to our place. Thank good, you. Good to have you. Minister, I've called you many things over the years, uh, but Minister, is my this is my first public occasion to address you as such. So a bit like me, you began as a career diplomat, but you were much more successful than I was at that. But then I went over to the dark side and uh, went into politics, and now you've done the same. What's it like? Uh, different. <laughs> uh, I, I guess uh, it's something you would know. I'm, I'm still uh, learning, in a sense, on the job. Uh, but, um, you know, um, it's being, in, in our case, being a minister is also being a member of parliament, attending parliament. Uh, it's, uh, that has its own discipline, its own culture, mm. uh, in a way. Uh, you're obviously uh, uh, a much more public person in, mm. in, with, in every sense of the term. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I guess in an interesting way, professionally, uh, you know, uh, even if you are, uh, I, I was the uh, sort of the senior most civil servant in the foreign ministry before, but there was always that comfort of having the minister above you. Uh, so when you actually are now the minister, your own horizons widen, your sense of, uh, uh, you know, the buck stopping with you also grows. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's a different feeling. It's a qualitatively different world. How are you getting on with the party whips in the uh, Indian upper house? The, the whips govern your life or death in parliament. So. Well, uh, you know, uh, we do, uh, we have a... Uh, a relatively narrow working major, you know, working uh, uh, sort of, uh, I won't say working majority because we actually don't have a majority in the upper house. Uh, so it's important that you are there for all the important, uh, you know, for the critical uh, legislation. Uh, and you have to balance that with your uh, diplomatic responsibilities. And sometimes, uh, frankly, you have to pass up some, you know, you have to prioritize. Uh, mm. I, for example, uh, could not uh, make it for the BRICS foreign ministers meeting because we had some very important bills coming up uh, mm. at that time. But uh, I'm a conscientious member. I'm always there for the vote. Have you missed, have you missked any votes yet? No. no. no, no not, ten uh, out of ten for the minister. Well, except yeah. for the ones when I was out. But, yeah, yeah. you know. Well. That's good. Well, whips govern your life. Uh, does uh, your BJP whip have a sense of humour? Mm. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, le I, let's put it this way. We haven't re tested all that yet. <laughs> uh, these things lie ahead of you, Minister. That's all I can say. But it must be operationally an interesting challenge if you're the foreign minister in particular mm -hmm. and you've got a rolling series of international challenges. Uh, India's an important country, so you've got people rolling in the door to Delhi all the time. Uh, and then you're in the upper house with this um, you know, wafer-thin parliamentary situation. So uh, I would encourage your whip to adopt a generous uh, human approach uh, to the demands of the minister. I'm sure you'll be urging him to do the same. The, um, here in New York, it's uh, General Assembly Week. Um, what's the core message this week uh, for the Indian government that you and Prime Minister Modi are seeking to deliver to the international community? Well, um, you know, the, uh, I think the big issue uh, before the world and before the United Nations right now uh, is how we're all going to deliver or not on the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. Uh, and uh, this, I mean, in a sense, I say this, uh, I mean, this is, this is an uh, analytical observation. I think whether the world would be successful in achieving SDG targets would be dependent on whether India would be successful, mm. because our numbers are so big mm. uh, here. Uh, and, uh, uh, if you see what's happened in the last five years, uh, actually uh, a lot of the changes in India are led by national campaigns, uh, very often uh, directly, personally pushed by the Prime Minister. Campaigns about gender, uh, gender uh, closing the gender gap, education. Campaigns about digital connectivity, about cleanliness, about sanitation, about... Uh, urbanization, about education, about skills. Uh, so you've had uh, actually a range of these uh, initiatives. Mm. Now, uh, these, these are not just slogans. You know, if you, if you look at the raw numbers, for example, uh, you know, there was a uh, push 
uh, to uh, get people uh, low, low or I mean really uh, sort of uh, poor people to open bank accounts. Okay, mm. they open up 300 million bank accounts. Mm. But more important, in those five years, actually 60 billion dollars went into those 300 mm. million bank accounts. Uh, they push for microfinance. Uh, microfinance, particularly with a uh, sort of uh, uh, bias towards uh, women. Mm. Uh, 75% of the users were women. Uh, they got uh, 260 million microfinance uh, mm. accounts up and up. If you look at rural housing, last five years, about uh, close to 18 million mm. rural homes. Gas connections, because you know, in Indian uh, women uh, very heavily use firewood, and mm. firewood is a killer. It's, I mean, literally, it's a killer. It's like yeah smoking multiple packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, they've got uh, close to 100 million, 96 million uh, new users of cooking gas who were enabled by the fact that he could appeal to people like me mm. to give up our uh, cooking gas connections which we were getting at subsidized rates. So uh, I, the, these are all, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, what's, what's shifting in India. Mm. Uh, the uh, story uh, on girls' education, uh, and which interestingly is linked to building of toilets, because girls didn't go to school because often there were no toilets in school. Mm. Uh, so if you got about 100 million toilets built, you also had an impact on many millions of girls going to school. Mm. And, that, and the moment you do something like school going, you're actually raising awareness, you are delaying marriage, uh, you know, uh, marriage uh, mm. uh, dates, I mean, ages in a way. Mm. Uh, you are improving health. Uh, you're also making people aware of the fact that they need to space out their kids. Mm. That has consequences. The demographic consequences, it has health consequences. Mm. So, so all of that is happening. And I think in, I mean, we, in a, in a sense, when I look at governance at home, you know, I sit in cabinet meetings where, you know, typically foreign policy is a very small element mm. of it. The bulk of what I hear there is actually SDG at work. Mm. And I think some of that, those messages will actually uh, come through out here. Yeah, I'm, uh, for my sins, I'm chairman of uh, Sanitation Water for All, mm -hmm. which is No, the... no, it's, it's, I, I'm aware of that. No, no, I, uh, so we're responsible globally as the um, civil society um, organization for sustainable development goal number six. So the proof point of what you just said is, we'll succeed in SDG six if you succeed yes. uh, in India. Um, it's pretty simple. And having been to India many times, and most recently when you were doing a major uh, public promotion for Swaj Park, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is Prime Minister Modi's uh, program for clean India, including the principal question of ending open defecation and dealing with uh, uh, the uh, widespread availability and use of toilets. I mean, the numbers are impressive. Uh, even, and I'm aware of the domestic debate about whether the numbers are all real or not, but let's just, just say you take a 10 or 20% discount. Look, could I it, comment on that? It's, it's still a big achievement. Yeah. Look, let me tell you what proves that the numbers were real. The fact that the numbers... He became a politician already. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, the, nu the numbers are real because in, finally they gave you real numbers in the voting booth. Yeah. You know, if you ask the question, why did uh, the government led by Mr. Modi not just get re-elected, mm -hmm. got re-elected by about, I think, eight, almost 8 to 10 percent votes more than they had. Mm. Those numbers led to these numbers. Mm. So there's a direct connection between what... Uh, we delivered uh, on the ground in the last five years. And what was the voter behavior? Because if you ask people, so why did you, because you know, you know the speculation, there were people who uh, said with great confidence that the numbers would drop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the last time I was here in Asia Society, we were having those conversations. Hmm. Not in public, but uh, we were. But the, I think the reason why the numbers went up hmm. and, and in any a democratic exercise, if in one term your numbers go up, uh, your, your voter base increases by about 10%. It's a remarkable achievement. And I think the reasons for that were twofold. The primary reason was that on the ground people saw change. Hmm. Uh, and uh, typically 
uh, at least in India where voters can be very impatient. Uh, you are elected with a lot of hope, then five years down the road there's impatience on the part of the voter. Yeah. But I think five years down the road, clearly they believe that uh, Mr. Modi was still the best uh, mm. uh, sort of uh, harbinger of change. Mm. Uh, and uh, probably now implementer of change. Uh, and the other, of course, was the national security side. I think they just mm. felt he was a safer pair of hands. Mm. So your overall argument about the outcome of the May elections uh, was that um, <clears throat> five years ago he actually triggered a significant, let's call it, um, set of social revolutions mm -hmm. um, against the list that you just referred to before, which are also consistent with global development goals. And, uh, and that actually has expanded the constituency for the BJP. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, I think it's also that uh, five years ago, uh, people looked at his record in Gujarat hmm. and hoped that, you know, uh, this would, uh, the developmental progress hmm. would kind of achieve national scale. I think that was the 2014 uh, hmm. uh, voting behavior. I think the 2019 voting behavior was, okay, we've seen him for five years, we've seen what his government looks like, we've seen you know, how serious he is about delivering mm. on all of this. And we actually believe this, you know, mm. so... Uh, They're starting to see uh, evidence. And, and therefore, uh, mm. let's, let's give him another term mm. and see where, where, uh, you know, where he can take us. That's good. You mentioned uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. One of them deals with climate. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got the UN Climate Summit this week as we prepare for five years into the Paris Treaty. Um, what's India's formal policy? What, is your, what are your Paris commitments? Are you meeting them? And will you be expanding on those commitments um, between now and 2030? Well, uh, look, uh, the, uh, the, my first point I'd make is that there's a big attitudinal shift okay on climate change and uh, in india in india okay uh, and uh, in uh, till a few years ago uh, people looked at climate change as something that was growing awareness mm -hmm. but it was also looked at as an international negotiation yeah. you know this was all about because kyoto kind of captured the the whole climate change issue mm. And you know the story of Kyoto. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know the promises made and the promises not kept. Mm. Uh, so the difference between Kyoto and Paris was that, and there was a transition in, through Copenhagen in between. Uh, the so difference, I there, uh, yes, uh, I wasn't, but uh, I, I got some graphic accounts of things which happened there. But uh, I, think I, I had a fight with the Indians. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> at Paris, I think the difference was that uh, we took the view that look. If it is really existential, you know, then you, know, you, you can't say on the one hand it's existential but it's subject to uh, kind of uh, uh, nitty-gritty of, of bargaining. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think we decided that we would, uh, we would actually take the lead uh, mm. in, in, on, on addressing the climate change challenges. I saw actually, you know, how much the Prime Minister was involved in actually structuring the compromises which led to Paris. You know, mm. we, were, we used to be traveling and on the phone, mm. taking calls uh, all mm. the time. I think uh, a lot of our, uh, our views and positions influenced uh, the G77, definitely. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, what we did uh, actually outside the Paris conference was, to my mind, the more important uh, outcome for us and for the world, which was we took decided we take the lead on advocating and implementing the spread of solar uh, mm. energy. And we unveiled what was actually the most ambitious solar uh, program to mm. date. Uh, we started something called the so International Solar Alliance, which has spectacularly mm. taken off. Uh, today, we have a very ambitious, uh, the target was 175 gigawatts. We are on our way mm. to meeting that. Uh, we've also, uh, much of our development assistance in Africa, in uh, Caribbean, in Pacific mm. Islands is geared around providing mm. uh, solar projects. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, you know, on my way here, I, I saw a very interesting analysis by the, uh, by the Climate Action Tracker, mm. uh, which, which you're familiar, familiar with. It, you're yeah. familiar with it. 
And what the, the analysis said was that there were two countries who actually exceeded their uh, nationally determined contributions. Mm, uh, one is Morocco. I forget who was the other one. There were five countries who have, uh, who have delivered on it with the two, two degree as, mm. the, as mm. meeting the two degree benchmark. And the five countries are uh, Bhutan, which is not a surprise, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Ethiopia, Philippines, and India. Uh, so actually, when it comes to delivering on mm. uh, on uh, Paris commitments, mm. uh, frankly, it appears from what I read, mm. uh, I haven't discussed it with my uh, own colleagues who deal with climate change, but from what I can gather, actually, it seems we're doing better than much of Europe and uh, mm. a lot of other countries. Well, it's a bit like everything else. Um, your success on climate, mm -hmm. and frankly, China's success mm -hmm. on climate, very much will determine the future of the world. Mm. Um, so um, uh, Prime Minister Modi's leadership domestically as well as globally on this will be crucial uh, in the period ahead. Um, you're here in the United States. Um, I watched um, Howdy Modi uh, mm -hmm. and thought... You, uh, you and a few million others. But yeah, I thought it was kind of fun. Uh, sort uh -huh. of, I'm not quite sure if it reminded me of Deng Xiaoping wearing a Stetson uh, back in the late 70s. But uh, this struck me as... Um, uh, interesting uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the evolving uh, Modi-Trump uh, relationship. Uh, personally, I could think of uh, no two more dissimilar personalities than Narendra Modi and Donald Trump. Uh, these are like chalk and cheese. These are just completely different people. But, my friend, it seems to be working. Um, so what's the actual substance of this relationship? What are its principal... Uh, opportunities and tensions right now, can you navigate it uh, through to obviously the end of next year and if there's a Trump re-elect beyond that? Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, uh, when it, uh, where the Houston event was concerned, I mean, I regard it in many ways uh, really as a tribute to the Indian American community mm. uh, that you had, uh, uh, you know, their ability today uh, to organize themselves, to mm. motivate themselves, to do an event of this scale. Mm. I mean, they had 50,000 people in the stadium and uh, I don't know how many people outside the stadium. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is not the first time. I mean, it started in Madison Square Garden mm. five years ago. Uh, then I remember. It, uh, yeah, <laughs> then uh, we did something a little bigger at San Jose the next year. So this is the third time and they've grown in scale. Now, um, uh, the fact that they can do this speaks in many ways, of some of the strengths of our relationship with the United States, and those are structural strengths. Mm. I mean, it shows uh, today that uh, the U.S. is still, in many ways, a land of equal opportunity for, mm. uh, certainly, that's how many Indian Americans would yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, feel. Uh, and uh, that uh, they have uh, really, and it was a very bipartisan event. I mean, mm. uh, while President Trump, obviously, uh, got a lot of the attention, but he was preceded on the stage by uh, the majority leader, Steny Hoy. Uh, mm. So, again, that speaks of the, mm. the political you know, mm. bandwidth of the Indian American community. Uh, so, we do see uh, the community today as one of the key pillars of the relationship mm. uh, and one of the many factors which have created a new paradigm between India mm. and the United States, which has evolved over the last 20 years. There are other factors as well, business factors, mm. uh, geopolitical factors. Mm. But uh, uh, in regard to uh, uh, the president uh, and the prime minister, uh, well, uh, look, I I've, I've, uh, saw them uh, the first time when they met in uh, Washington in 2017. Mm. Uh, and, you know, sometimes even if people are not the same, they hit it off. I mean, it was very, it's very visible that they, you know, when they meet, that mm. they bond well. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, when, you know, when you ask, saying, okay, where is this going? I, I think one difference for us in India, uh, one, Indians themselves are very adjustable people by, mm. by nature. Some, I mean, it's, it's part of our DNA. Mm. Uh, secondly, Prime Minister Modi is a very outgoing person. Mm. So, if you know, so if it's you and me, and we are very different, he he kind of shifts gears and responds to you mm. in a way in which it works with you, and 
with mm. me in a way in which it works with me. So uh, you've had two very different presidents, uh, Obama and Trump, back to back. But mm. he's actually That's had very... the understatement yeah. of, the, of the morning. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's uh, had very, very, uh, you know, a warm, cordial, personal... You know, he had a great relationship yeah, with yeah, Barack. With, with both of them. Mm. Uh, but it's also, you know, there's a, there's a larger issue here, which is, uh, remember, we are not... You know, we don't have the history with the United States and with American leaders, which many other countries do. Mm. So because we don't have that history, when there is change, we don't have those anxieties. Mm. You know, a large part of what you see in East Asia or what you see in Europe are actually leaders fretting because mm. today's reality is a, is a departure from the norm. Okay. Mm. With India, there was no norm. Mm. We, were, we were still a relationship very much in progress. So for us, okay, there's one more adjustment to be made. Mm. It's so um, the trade dispute, uh, which has been long-standing now between the Trump administration and your government, uh, can you get an agreement? Uh, and are you now singing from the same song sheet uh, on the quad? Um, and China. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on the trade arguments, uh, not disputes, uh, because uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, there is a lot of backing and forthing on those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, look, uh, the U.S. today has uh, taken a certain approach towards its trade relations with the entire world. Uh, so what's happening in the case of India uh, is not unusual. In fact, I would say compared to some of the uh, more public arguments they had with other countries, and some of those are disputes. Mm. Uh, uh, ours is, to my mind, much more uh, manageable in, in many ways. So they're not, they're not, I mean, trade issues by nature are not also easy to resolve. That's why mm. trade negotiators make mm. a living. Uh, so, uh, but... Uh, I wondered uh, what they did. <laughs> they're making yeah. a living. Yeah. So, so uh, the, uh, uh, my, my expectation is, and in fact... Uh, uh, my trade, my trade ministerial colleague is also in town uh, today. Uh, that look, we'll we'll work our way through it. Yeah. I mean, we will agree on some things. We probably may not agree on everything. There'll be issues we don't. It's not. There's no uh, sort of finite uh, sort of uh, deadline mm. on which all of these things work. These are mm. ongoing conversations because trade is ongoing and new things. You know, a few years ago, for example, uh, data issues. Were, were not even there on, on the radar. Hmm. Uh, today, uh, you, you know, we may have uh, differing perspectives on a matter like that. Uh, or uh, some years ago, steel uh, was, was really not a subject of dispute hmm. or even argument. Uh, so, so trade will keep changing. But here's the good news. I am encouraged when more attention goes to that zone because it actually means there's more activity happening there. Mm -hmm. The larger the trade, the more the arguments. Mm. I'd agree. But I won't let you slide off quad. So uh, what's, uh, where's the, um, uh, is there a common uh, Indian and uh, American strategic view of China? Is there a common view of the quad? Are you going to bring the Australians in from the cold on Malabar? Uh, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. The uh, on you know my my sense is big countries, perhaps more than big countries, maybe all countries today, uh, won't have common score sheets. I mm. I think everybody would have their own uh, lyrics and their own tunes, mm. uh, but there would be notes that they would strike together, and occasionally it would be cacophonic and That's sometimes right. seem like an orchestra. Uh, but uh, uh, so you're, I, you're a composer. Tell me how you would write the score. No, I look. <laughs> I, I think we are we are moving to a world of convergences, where mm. uh, a lot of it would be situational, a lot of it would be issue based, a lot of it would be regional. Mm. Uh, I mean, we may agree uh, in a, in Indo Pacific, but we may not agree uh, in the Gulf. Uh, mm. So, uh, so uh, I, I I do think we are looking at much more complicated, uh, differentiated uh, relationships today, rather than clean cut, you know, you're with me, you're not, you're ally, you're mm. not, 
uh, we are allies, we have a common unified position. I don't think we are, we are anymore into the unified mm. positions world. I think we've just moved uh, away from that. So there would be, you know, where the, where the Quad is concerned, right now, uh, till now the Quad's been largely at the official level. Mm. We are exploring how to raise it beyond that. Uh, now, um, the Quad's largely been discussing maritime security, uh, connectivity, uh, terrorism. These are issues on which uh, these four countries, uh, India, Japan, uh, Australia, US, uh, happen to, uh, you know, they're democratic countries with uh, a very uh, strong similarity of approaches on these mm. issues. Mm. That's not to say we agree, I mean, let's say an issue like climate change. Mm. Uh, our position uh, with each one of the Quad countries, we would have, uh, the, I won't say disagreement, but clearly very different positions. Mm. So it would very much depend on, on, on the issue and uh, the partner concerned. Good. That brings us to the uh, elephant in the room, China, mm -hmm. um, country next door to you. You've spent a bit of time there. Mm -hmm. um, let me start by um, uh, opening it up on uh, what the government of India has done most recently on Kashmir. Um, this is a significant decision from Delhi. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could explain to our gathering here uh, what is the Indian government seeking to achieve? How do you think um, both um, Pakistan and China are responding and where to from here? The uh, one sentence answer to that is read today's Financial Times. It has an op-ed by me and don't okay. look at the picture. Okay. Uh, so that's my one sentence answer, but I'll give you the longer answer. Uh, they always choose photographs to make the subject feel uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, that's, those are well-developed skills. That's right. So all that say, Jai, is get used to it. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, you to, to sort of b walk back a bit on Kashmir. Hmm. Uh, look, uh, the first point which people should appreciate is that the provision in the Constitution which gave Kashmir a different status hmm. was a temporary provision. Hmm. Now, here's the funny thing. You rarely read that in the international press. Uh, and when I say it's a temporary provision, don't take my word for it. Google the Constitution of India. It's written out there. Mm. The word temporary is out there mm. on the heading of the segment as well as the article in question. Now, I think we all, I know you're Australian, but we agree on what the word temporary means. It means mm. something comes to an end. It, after 70 years, it came to an end. And 70 years is a decent definition of the word temporary. So what will now so, change? So, so let me come to why it changed. Okay. Now, what happened was, uh, at the time when Kashmir joined uh, India, as did about 560 other princely states, uh, Kashmir was unique. One, it was uh, a border state. Uh, two, it was under attack as it was negotiating its accession from Pakistan. So the sense in the Constitu Constituent Assembly was that we need to you know, cut them some slack, give them some more different terms. In and the give Indian them, Constituent Assembly yes. of 1947, 48. Yes, right. Mm. In which, by the way, the Kashmiri representatives joined in. Mm. So the sense was that, OK, these guys are, are, are coming under different circumstances. So let's give them, a, 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 in a sense, a different a terms uh, for alignment, give them more time and space to do that. Now, uh, over a, so over a period of time, uh, what happened was the accession, the integration of the state of Jammu and Kashmir with the rest of India proceeded much more gradually uh, than did all the other princely states. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, it came through a series of presidential orders uh, which were provided for by this temporary provision. Mm. So there, were, uh, there are in the last 70 years about 54 of these presidential orders. Now, uh, in the 19, uh, 19, around late 80s, as the uh, Afghan, the first Afghan mm. uh, war came to an end, uh, the, uh, we saw a spiking of terrorism in Kashmir, cross-border mm. terrorism. 
people coming from across mm -hmm. the line of control. Now, they created a, a sort of intimidatory effect uh, on the polity. Mm -hmm. And so the, the entire alignment process actually slowed down. So if you actually track those presidential mm -hmm. proclamations, you get much more in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s mm. than you do thereafter. Now, what did it mean on the ground? What it meant on the ground was that uh, because you had a provision which said there'd be essentially local ownership of property, there were no investments from outside. Mm. Uh, a lot of the change, the economic changes you see in the rest of India, the businesses that they you see. They're past Kashmir by. They're past Kashmir. Mm. Okay. Now, so what was meant to actually help Kashmir ended up in a way as, you know, the, the bridge became a barrier uh, mm. in a way. Now, uh, what, it had political consequences and eventually national security consequences because when you didn't have enough activity and therefore not enough jobs, mm. and then people blame Delhi for not having enough jobs. Mm. Uh, you were, we were spending 10 times, from, the, from Delhi's perspective, 10 times on on an average Kashmiri, which we're spending on an average Indian citizen. Mm. But yet the feeling was, well, you know, we haven't seen uh, what's, what's due to us. So the, the lack of development, lack of opportunity actually created a sense of alienation. Mm. Alienation to separatism, separatism used for terrorism. Mm. And the story of Kashmir, because people, you know, somehow there's a suggestion that things have become worse and, you know, something changed uh, mm. uh, for the worse on August 5th when this mm. uh, legislation was passed. Look at the 30 years before that. There were about more than 40,000 people have died in Kashmir. Mm. Okay? And it isn't just those numbers. I mean, if you look, uh, you had on the streets of Srinagar, you know, senior police officials lynched in broad daylight. Mm. Uh, you know, eminent journalists killed. Mm. You had military personnel going home on leave pulled out of the homes and uh, tortured and killed. That, I mean, that in a sense gave you a, you know, uh, mm. uh, a feel for, for the state mm. of affairs before. Now, uh, when we, uh, there, there were also interesting socio-economic uh, uh, consequences. Because uh, national laws did not automatically apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, pretty much the progressive legislation which has been enacted in India over the last 20 years has passed that state. Mm. Uh, so it's still a state where, uh, you know, uh, women's property rights are less than men's. Mm. Uh, a state where, uh, say, domestic violence laws don't apply. Uh, juvenile protection laws don't apply. Right to work, right to education, right to information doesn't apply. Uh, the affirmative action programs that you had in the rest of India don't apply. So. So, you know, you actually have socially bypassed, you know, bypassed that state, you've economically disadvantaged that state, you've created a national security problem for yourself, you've created an integration challenge. So, when we came back to power, uh, I think there was a long, hard look mm. at what are our options. And the options were either we do more of the same, knowing it doesn't work, or we do something different. So I think the choice was, okay, we will do something different. Now, when we did that something different, and the, something different, by the way, has no implications for the external boundaries of India. I mean, we are not, uh, we are sort of reformatting this within our existing boundaries. It obviously drew a reaction from Pakistan. It drew a reaction from China. There were two very different reactions. Mm. I think for Pakistan, it was a country which has really created an entire industry of terrorism to deal with the Kashmir uh, mm. issue. I mean, in my view, it's actually bigger than Kashmir. I think they've created it for India, but let that pass for the moment. Who now see that, that investment of 70 years undercut if this policy succeeds. Mm. Okay? So theirs is, I think, today a reaction of uh, uh, anger, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, frustration in many ways, because you've built an entire industry over a long period of time. What do you think they will do? Uh, They've said a lot, but what will they do? Yeah, uh, but let me, let me close out the China bit. I think the China bit, uh, the Chinese, I think, misread what was happening there, which was they reacted uh, to the fact that the state uh, today constitutes two union territories. 
Uh, now, I don't know why they believe that it impacted on them. Uh, I, I went a few days after the legislation to China uh, and uh, explained to them that, you know, as far as they were concerned, nothing had changed. India's boundaries had not changed. The line of actual control had not changed. Uh, so that was a conversation uh, we had with them. But obviously, uh, you know, the Pakistani uh, sort of challenges of a very different order. Uh, in uh, respect of what will they do, your question? Hmm. Look, uh, they, have to, they have to accept, and this is not a Kashmir issue, it's a bigger issue than that. They have to accept that the model which they have built for themselves no longer works. Hmm. That you cannot, uh, in this day and age, conduct policy using uh, terrorism as a legitimate instrument of statecraft. I think that's at the heart of the issue. Mm. Uh, uh, so, I mean, we, we have no uh, problem talking to Pakistan, but we have a problem talking to Terroristan. Mm. And they have to be one and not be the other. Moving to uh, the broader relationship with China, uh -huh. um, the, um, I watched with uh, keen interest um, Prime Minister Modi's um, discussions with um, Xi Jinping, I think, from memory in Wuhan. Uh, in that two or three day meeting from memory um, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, um, what sort of framework uh, did that lay out for the future of the India-China relationship? Um, and what do you now see as its prospects? India still, for example, is not party to One Belt, One Road. Uh, you have geopolitical reservations against aspects of it. Um, but on the broader economic front, the broader national security front, and of course the uh, long-standing question of the border, uh, what's your uh, approach to the future of that relationship? Uh, you know, the Wuhan meeting, to my mind, was a very good thing. Mm. Uh, it was very good because uh, the two countries today have very strong leaders mm. uh, with uh, both with, you know, strategic mm. visions uh, and a sense of the world and a sense of their country's destiny uh, in the world. And uh, to my mind, the real benefit of Wuhan was the fact that the two of them, President uh, Xi and Prime Minister Modi, could actually spend time just, I mean, they just, were the two of them, if you look at the pictures, the two of them and the interpreters, okay? Mm. So now you know uh, a lot of the way by which business is done in China is it's very choreographed. It's uh, very choreographed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know we meet on these long tables and you know we give our principle, their talking points, and they give theirs, and uh, they, they kind of exchange those in a way. Now these were real conversations. Hmm. They were real free willing conversations with no agreed agenda. I, I think, to my mind, uh, that's an extremely important, mm. very uh, uh, significant development. Because, mm. uh, uh, look, what we do know, I mean, we can debate the pace and the complexity of the process, but it's a given today that, you know, China will be among the key global powers of our era, and, you know, India in its own way will be too, perhaps at a different pace and a different timeline. Uh, so if these two powers in the next 20, 30 years are going to have such an important role, uh, then uh, we need to start preparing for that. Mm -hmm. And we need to start preparing for that by encouraging an equilibrium between these two powers. Because their relationship uh, with the world is shifting, but the relationship with each other will also be very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Because neither of them is really static. Mm. Uh, static at home or static mm. in relationship to the rest of the world. So, to, and then to do that, you need to have those open conversations, conversations about the world, conversations about your country, conversations about politics, so don't hold back. Mm. So I think that's what we saw at Wuhan. Mm. Our hope is that we will see a repeat of that uh, in the not too distant future. Mm. And uh, personally, I, I, you know, uh, uh, I, as someone who's grappled with this challenge on the field. I'm very pleased that we have reached this stage. Mm. And, and now having said that, look, these are not negotiating sessions. 
So when some of the observations you made that you know you have a boundary problem and uh, you know mm. you have we have our viewpoint on Belt and Road, uh, yes, of course we do. But we have there's a time and place to talk that and to negotiate that. Mm. This is not an this is not a negotiation between the two leaders. Mm. This is really the two of them sort of discussing, exchanging, you know, mm. uh, looking at the world in the sort mm. of big, big picture mm. uh, sense of the term. Mm. If you um, uh, think of um, China's future, and you mentioned before China's trajectory in terms of becoming a global great power, the economic trajectory has been there for some time, um, and India um, has its own trajectory, uh, if you look uh, at some of the current challenges facing China's own political economy model uh, as it seeks to sustain growth, and this very difficult relationship between uh, party and market, uh, between state owned enterprises and private firms, uh, and you see the ebb and flow of this uh, policy debate within China itself flowing through to slower growth rates uh, for the Chinese economy in the last few years. Uh, does Delhi see this as a potential opportunity for itself um, to accelerate its own uh, domestic market economic reforms? By which I mean, now you've got a whole lot of capital in this country, from this country, the United States, which is disinvesting from China um, because of uh, not just the uncertainties of the trade war between the two, not an argument, not a dispute, but a war. Uh, and an uncertainty about whether this leads in a broader direction of economic decoupling. So uh, I'm not into the binary business as a matter of um, policy preference. But I wondered whether our friends in Delhi had seen some shift in global perceptions of the, as it were, eternal riches of the China market relative to what India could now provide. Well, uh, look, I would make a set of points, and you can connect the dots. Uh, number one, uh, what is happening in China is not, uh, economically, is not unexpected. I mean, everybody knew that the economy would mature, and as it does, uh, growth rates would uh, not be what they were uh, earlier. Uh, so that's my first point. Uh, secondly, where India is concerned, you know, we are in it uh, certainly on the economic side for ourselves. I mean, if I, you know, I, I would make myself a more attractive uh, destination for foreign investment and even for domestic investment, not because it's a foreign policy issue, because, because it's an economic, uh, it's economic common sense. So uh, today, if I, let's say, if I cut my corporate tax, which is what we did last mm -hmm. week, uh, with the intention of uh, uh, sort of uh, spurring investments. Uh, that's an Indian decision for India. Non, you know, you don't take that saying what's, you know, it's, 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 it's not part of a larger foreign mm. policy strategic uh, design. Uh, when we, we are open today to Chinese uh, investment in many sectors. In fact, in the last five years, we've seen an increase in Chinese foreign mm. uh, investment, FDI. Uh, we are obviously very open to it uh, from the United States. If for whatever reason, uh, I mean US uh, supply chains are, are shifting, relocating, mm. and may not be only from China, I mean they could be from other countries as well. Mm. I mean, we'd be happy to host them. That's, mm. that's very much our... Mm. Uh, uh, so there is a there is a sort of merit in doing it for its own sake, not necessarily as part of a calculation uh, on China. Hmm. Now we've got a few questions from the audience, so um, I will select these in a degree of difficulty, if that's <laughs> okay, uh, because I know you can happily accommodate uh, to uh, whichever of these. Uh, what does Pakistan need to do as a precondition for Kashmir talks? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you, you want me to go question by question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Look, I, I think we're getting this wrong. Uh, you know, first of all, Pakistan has to do something 
for its own good. Uh, and if it does that, it would enable a normal neighborly relationship with mm. India. The issue between India and Pakistan, I mean, it's not like we agree on everything else and we have wonderful relationship and there's a Kashmir issue. I mean, you know, we had an attack on Mumbai city. The last mm. time I checked, Mumbai city was not part of Kashmir. Mm. So, so, you know, if Pakistani terrorists can attack uh, states and regions which are far removed from Kashmir, we got to recognize there's a bigger problem out there. Mm. So what's the problem? The problem is really a mindset. I mean, uh, look, what we have today, every time there's a change of government in Pakistan, somebody says, look, first of all, it's new, and nothing to do with the earlier guys, it's all their fault. Second position, by the way, it's nothing to do with us as a country, it's all the Americans. You know, the Americans taught us the bad habits by doing the Afghan Jihad. Mm. We were good people till you came along. By the way, you, I'm, I know you're not an American. Uh, so, uh, it's true. Uh, but, uh, so the, the point is, there is a fundamental issue there which they need to understand. And we need to encourage them to do. Mm. And that is to move away from terrorism. Mm. And it's not, you know, it's not at one level, we under, you know, it's a huge issue. At one level, it's a very obvious issue. I mean, these are not activities which are subterranean. Mm. These are activities in broad daylight. So they know where the camps are. Uh, I mean, anybody knows where the camps are. Just Google them, you'll find them. The, uh, which leads to another question from the audience, which is, uh, what's the first question we at the Asia Society should ask Imran Khan when he comes here to speak <laughs> on Friday? <laughs> you don't need the answer to that. I just thought I'd try. <laughs> The, um, and here's an interesting one. Someone in the audience has a genuine sense of humour. Uh, Donald Trump has offered to mediate and help on Kashmir. Will you be taking up his offer? <laughs> I'll move on to any other questions from the audience. The um, one um, point I was going to raise... Uh, well, there's a question here. I'll take this one from this uh, gentleman. Yes, Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike's coming to you, sir. Yes, my name is Farooq Siddiqui, and I am from Kashmir. Uh, the Foreign Minister uh, spoke about uh, the instrument of accession that uh, the Maharaja, when acceded to India, it was at, on the basis of three conditions. One was the foreign policy, the other was the defense, and the third was the communication. That time, it was, there was no constitution of India. So the Constitution of India came into being in 1950, right? 49, 26th November. Yeah, 49. That's when it was finalized. So Article 37, 370 and Article 35A, which is two separate things, 370 article was provided in the Constitution of India to honor the instrument of accession, which Indian government took to the United Nations as a proof that India has, that Kashmir has acceded to India on the basis of those instruments of accession. You need to move and to your question, sir. Yes, my question is that how is it possible that India can remove this particular condition of 370 and 35A because it reflects the instrument okay. of exactly. okay. I, I, I get so it. I, Let me complete the question. Uh, no, I think we've got the question, yes. sir, and I think we'll the move to the answer. The question is that once Article 370, 370 is removed, that means India's relationship with Kashmir is over. And what is there is 800,000 army. I think we've got the, the question, so sir, is, and I think I'm going to take the microphone okay. from you. Good. Uh, okay. I'm Look, actually chairing the meeting, not you. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, so let me uh, let me give a, a short, clear uh, answer to uh, the questions there. I, I think there are two two misconceptions. Number one, uh, a misconception that the instrument of accession, which was signed by the ruler of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, was different from those of the others. In fact. Uh, you, can, you can, again, this is public information. I have it on my phone. If you look at the, do 
the uh, instrument of accession. And remember, the, the British bureaucracy at that time was very strong and had impacted all of us. Everybody, all the princely states, got exactly the same document to sign. This document was typed up. It had a blank for the name of the ruler, a blank for the name of the state, a blank for the date, and a blank because Lord Mountbatten of Burma wanted to sign his full name in a fountain pen uh, <laughs> by you know, himself. 500, Otherwise, 520 times. Right? Uh, yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> every one of these instruments of accession were exactly the same. All of them began by saying that we are now acceding and handing over powers related to foreign affairs, defense, and communications to the Union of India. Now, the constitution-making process which happened thereafter uh, from, uh, from 1947 till 49 involved them, all the princely states, now aligning with the constitution in the making. Now, as I explained, in the case of Jammu and Kashmir, the sentiment in the constituent assembly with Kashmiri participation was that they needed more time to do that alignment, which is why you had as I said, a provision with the word temporary return on it, on the title of it and on the text of the article. Now, the gentleman raised the issue that, you know, 370, when it was a temporary article, that's your relationship with the state of Kashmir. Actually, it's not. There is an article in the Constitution, Article 1, which actually lists out all the constituent parts of India. So the relationship is not based on article. It cannot be based on a temporary article. It obviously has to be based on a permanent article. So I think there are two factual inaccuracies or misunderstandings of the Constitution of India. Take my word for it. I've read it many times. I'm a student of political science as well. Uh, so I would uh, respectfully urge you to go back and look at the Constitution of India. Let me just flick um, beyond uh, Kashmir to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as being uh, the optimal um, landing place uh, for uh, the negotiations between uh, the Taliban and the Americans, uh, but more broadly for the long-term stabilization of the country? And where does Indian policy fit? Look, I, I think this is today one of the big vexing questions in our part of the world. And uh, I must tell you on this trip, uh, it is an issue which I would be talking to a number of people. Yesterday I met Ambassador Khalil Saad. Mm. I also uh, had a meeting with the Iranian Foreign Minister Javed Sarif. Mm. Uh, and I will be, I'm going from here on to Washington, so mm. I expect to discuss it with Secretary Pompeo as well. Mm. Uh, and with many others uh, who are here. This, I, I met many of the Central Asians yesterday, Tajikistan, mm. Uzbekistan. Mm. And everybody really has uh, a common set of uh, concerns, anxieties, interests on this issue. Uh, you know, at one level, we understand the compulsions on the United States. 18 mm. years is a long time to be fighting a war. Mm. You know, and, and actually, frankly, I take my hats off to the United States that it had the, uh, the, uh, the durability and the persistence and the commitment and the fortitude uh, to do that for so long. Uh, so, it's apparent that this is going to change. Mm. Okay. The question which we need to answer is how much changes, in what way, what, is the, what are the consequences of those changes? Now, uh, that's, some of that is what is, has been negotiated between the American negotiators mm. uh, and the Taliban and uh, you know, um, whatever is happening with the government, in, uh, the Afghan government, the mm. elected Afghan government in Kabul. Uh, we know different countries have also been involved, mm. some of them, in this process. Uh, our point of view is this. Recognizing the, the compulsions of this mm. change, uh, we do think that many of the achievements of the last 18 years, it, and for which you know, so many countries have fought, you know, shed blood, spent money, mm. uh, uh, they, those achievements should not be lost mm. uh, in the process. So whatever the outcomes, whatever the, uh, uh, the likely direction in which Afghanistan mm. is going, it must be such that uh, these, uh, mm. these are not uh, jeopardized by, uh, by uh, uh, you know, what, what could be agreed 
uh, upon. Uh, we ourselves, uh, you know, we had a very strong history of development assistance there. Mm. Uh, in terms of delivery of projects, we've been really among the better deliverers. Mm. Uh, you know, whether you look at bringing electricity to Kabul city mm. or building a dam in Herat province or mm. uh, doing health clinics, radio stations, schools, mm. uh, building a road through uh, western Afghanistan. We've done a lot, lot of that. But obviously now, now we'll have to see with the larger direction which is going. But our preference, obviously, our interests are that the gains of the last 18 years should not be jeopardized. The a country which uh, Prime Minister Modi has placed particular attention uh, on, and one which uh, you have um, obvious connections with and interest in, I presume Japanese is one of your uh, seven languages, um, is, of course... Uh, Tokyo and Abe-san and, uh, and uh, Modi-san uh, have a, um, what appears to the rest of us to be a strong working relationship. If you were to try for this audience to explain where do you see uh, the strategic significance of your relationship with, India, uh, with uh, Japan uh, heading over the next five years, uh, give us some sense of the texture of that. Well, first of all, I must tell you that reports of my linguistic skills are vastly exaggerated uh, as much as rumors of my tact and diplomatic abilities. Uh, so having got that disclaimer out of the way... Uh, look, do, you, do you speak Australian as well as English? Uh, I'm working on that. I'm taking lessons. I watch cricket to, uh, to uh, understand Australia. It was good winning the Ashes. Uh, so, so. But so, I, I won't dwell on that. Uh, uh, they so, deserved it. Uh -huh. <laughs> you notice I'm not contradicting you. No, that's right. Yeah. Uh, we have our own shared colonial past in a strange way. So. But, um, you know, but coming to Japan, uh, look, I, I do think it, it's really a very, uh, at the moment, a very under-analyzed, under or shall I say, a relationship that hasn't uh, got the prominence that it should. Maybe it's all for the good, uh, because it's still a stage where this relationship is mm. growing. Uh, and uh, uh, we see, uh, you know, Asia is changing. The world is changing. Asia is changing. Uh, and probably these changes would be better if we saw, uh, in many ways, a greater Japanese uh, uh, participation in international affairs. Uh, because if, we are, if our declared objective is a multipolar world, uh, to my mind, its prerequisite is a multipolar Asia. Mm. Uh, and if you're talking of a multipolar Asia, obviously one of the natural poles, one of them, is Japan. Mm. Uh, now, the, how much the Japanese do and what they do and how they do, these are for them to decide. Mm. But we have seen much greater interest uh, on their part uh, in uh, participating in uh, security-related conversations, political conversations. They are, we work with them in the Quad. We actually have a trilateral uh, with Japan and America, mm. which uh, completely coincidentally is called J. Mm. Uh, uh, we have, uh, we work with them on the reform of the UN Security Council. We have a G4 will be meeting uh, this week uh, at the foreign minister's level. So, but the Japanese also have been much more active in investing in India, uh, in, uh, in uh, collaborating with us on connectivity <coughs> initiatives, mm. uh, in uh, looking at a range of global issues. So, mm. uh, you know, I was in Japan 20 years ago. Okay. They were much more reticent about their own potential. Yeah. And their, it's been uh, a big change in yeah. Tokyo. And uh, I think those changes are good. Mm. You know, it's not for me to say whether they're good for Japan. I think they are, but you mm. know, that's for them to decide. But they're certainly good for India. Mm. Let me sort of try to begin to draw this conversation to a close because I know you've got to go off and see um, uh, the Donald um, and, and, uh, and that'll be a fun meeting. The, um, but uh, India and the future of uh, global uh, trade um, rightly or wrongly, India has been criticised in the past for being excessively protectionist, um, for not um, 
being a, um, shall we say, full and open participant in global trade uh, negotiations, the particular role which uh, India played in, in the uh, destiny of the Doha round. But let's not revisit history. Um, uh, looking to the future and uh, the opening of, um, of markets within uh, the wider Indo-Pacific region, uh, give me your sense of where RCEP goes, give me your sense of where broader Indian policy on trade goes, and let me uh, challenge you on the question of, uh, of uh, Indian accession to APEC uh, and where you would like to see your country go on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, look, uh, my understanding of the uh, RCEP negotiations, the ministers met uh, earlier this month in Bangkok. Uh, I think it's very advanced. Uh, the, the key point that we make is that, I mean, one which I make as a foreign minister is that RCEP is a trade agreement and its merits and demerits must be weighed on mm. the scale of trade. It's, it's, it has political strategic implications and connotations, but they cannot be the principal criteria of evaluating a trade agreement. A trade agreement must stand on its own feet. There must be good trade offers out there to justify that agreement. Mm. Now, what are the big concerns? I mean, a big concern, of course, is we have free trade agreements with many of the current RCEP uh, participant countries. Mm. So the new ones are, are the important ones because we don't have agreements with them at all. One is China, one is Australia, one is New Zealand. Mm. Uh, they, they each, you know, have their own particular complications and wrinkles. Uh, we have a big trade deficit with China, which everybody knows, which is a source of concern uh, for, for Indian business. So how well are these challenges addressed? Mm. How well are challenges of, uh, you know, you, and there are creative solutions. I, I, I don't think this is beyond the realm of mm. uh, Imagination. I, I think uh, uh, trade negotiators can find fixes uh, in terms of coverage and time, and uh, uh, there are answers there. There are another set of issues. My understanding, again, is uh, these relate to services, uh, which is really they've got to be good services offers on the table because mm. it's something which is important for India. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so I, I think the call would be: look, if if those gaps are closed. Uh, mm. in the near future, uh, then the chances are high that we would have uh, mm. an RCEP. Uh, now, uh, in terms of what you said about the APEC, uh, you know, uh, India has been steadily pulled eastwards. Okay? It began in 1992 with what was called the Look East. Mm. But the Look East, we really looked at Southeast Asia in many ways as a sort of a model, as a lesson, and, and as a justification for changes which we were trying to do, and yep. an inspiration for those changes. Mm-hmm. Now, in the 25 years that have passed, Look East became Act East because the connectivities got built up, mm. the conversations expanded, the, uh, the relationships expanded. So today we have security relations with all these countries, mm. which we didn't have before mm. with the ASEAN 10. Uh, we have many more flights, we have a lot of investment, a lot of Indian companies <laughs> operating out there. Now, the next stage was to go beyond, to Indo-Pacific. And Indo-Pacific because uh, beyond the ASEAN, we actually found that today our principal trade partners are actually China, Japan, Korea, Mm. uh, and uh, to now, to a large extent, Australia. Uh, So we've actually, if you looked, for us, the center of gravity Mm. in terms of our economic interests and consequently of our strategic interests has steadily shifted Mm. eastwards. So, and... Uh, given the other developments which have happened, the repositioning of America, the mm. rise of China, a lot of the artificial silos between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean have also mm. become irrelevant. So you have the Indo-Pacific. So for me, if you actually do the RCEP agreement and you have, and that becomes your economic trade framework, mm. uh, and uh, the, you have the Indo-Pacific as your strategic approach in a way, uh, then obviously that brings you that much closer towards Mm. APEC. I mean, APEC has its own process challenges. But to me, the case for APEC would grow Mm. uh, with this. Yeah, I mean, my argument about APEC uh, is simply, um, and not just that it was an Australian idea 25 years ago, but um, it's actually worked for all the member states Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in its own crazy way. Mm. Um, Not least because all of these disconnected economies in various stages of economic opening 
at the official class level, were forced to work with each other for the first time. <coughs> and so suddenly they found colleagues and friends in the mm. relevant ministries, whether it's civil aviation or domestic energy or God knows whatever, from uh, whether it's Laos, the Philippines, South Korea and wherever, and they're all in this thing together. It was quite interesting. Uh, and in fact, it was largely domestically driven, which is why I've always seen it as being a great thing for India in itself, but also mm. for the wider region to have uh, India as a party to this... Um, uh, I think, useful pan-regional institution when we still don't have a pan-regional security body, which I think is still a missing element in our architecture. Mm -hmm. We've been privileged today to have uh, the Foreign Minister of India with us um, to spend some time. I'd like to, to express your appreciation in the conventional fashion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.